Dark Ages is a term used for the early Middle Ages, or sometimes the entire Middle Ages in Western Europe, just after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. As evident by the name, these were tough times and Europe was struggling to survive. The continent had plunged into economic, intellectual, and cultural decline. The concept of a Dark Age was proposed by the Italian scholar Petrarch in the 1330s, when he regarded the post-Roman centuries as dark in comparison with the light of classical antiquity. While historians and scholars have altogether started avoiding the use of the term Dark Ages due to its negative connotation, that does not mean the horrifying conditions and rituals of medieval Europe were any less daunting. Petrarch's pejorative meaning remains in use in popular culture and often simply views the Middle Ages as a time of violence, backwardness, and turmoil. Life was definitely not easy back then. All the technological advancements, rights, and social progress we see today never existed back then, and the underprivileged had to fight tooth and nail just to survive. Here are 10 true stories from the Dark Ages. 1. The Judas Cradle The medieval times of Europe spanning around four centuries were probably worse than hell for people who broke the law. The tales of horrible acts from those days make people's toes curl even today. Technological developments such as the compass, mechanical clock, vertical windmills, spectacles, and torture devices also became the new normal during that period. Hundreds of brutal torture devices were conceived and created with the sole purpose of inflicting pain on others. The Judas Cradle or the Judas Chair is probably one of the most famous and terrifying one of these devices. The guided chair is an Italian man's invention purportedly used by the Spanish Inquisition. It was designed by Ippolito Marsigli and was supposed to deal with heretics. Multiple torturers operated the Judas Cradle. One person used to be in charge, while the others assisted him. The torture device was created in 16th century Spain, when the institution of the Inquisition was pretty common. With every passing day, new and creative techniques of torture were devised to aid the process of suffering. The torturers were paid a stipend, and their job was to extract the required information or confession from the victims. The use of this device was more common towards the end of medieval times. The primary purpose of the Judas Cradle may have been religious, but it was often used against political opponents too. The cradle was a pyramid-shaped wooden or metal seat on top of which the victim was placed. Their hands and feet would be tied to prevent them from shifting their weight. The feet were usually tied with each other to increase pain whenever there was the slightest movement. The pointed edge of the pyramid was slowly passed into the privates of the victim, which caused them unbearable pain. The torture would last for days, and the damage caused by it was permanent. To make things worse, torturers would add weights to facilitate the effect which sometimes led to death by impalement. The victims who refused to speak would be raised and dropped on the Judas Cradle several times during interrogations. At the time, the leaders believed that torturing people using the Judas Cradle or other devices was the only way forward to grow as a community and filtering out the liars and heretics. The stories from the Dark Ages have revealed that the purpose of this inhumane treatment was to keep the Catholic faith away from impurities. 2. The Black Plague the leadership wasn't the only one torturing the European citizens during the Dark Ages. Nature was also out to get them. The Black Death also called the pestilence and the Great Mortality was a bubonic plague pandemic that devastated Western Eurasia and North Africa between 1346 and 1353. It is considered the most fatal pandemic in recorded human history and caused the deaths of between 75 and 200 million people. The pandemic peaked in Europe from 1347 to 1351. It was caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis that was spread by fleas. However, during the Black Death, it also took a secondary form according to experts and began spreading by person-to-person -person contact via aerosols. This led to septicemic or mnemonic plagues. It was actually the beginning of the second plague pandemic in the region. It created religious, social, and economic upheavals that profoundly affected the course of European history. The origin of the plague is disputed. Modern genetic analysis suggests that Yersinia pestis evolved in the Tian Shan Mountains on the border between Kyrgyzstan and China, 
around 2,600 years ago. It was first introduced to Europe during the siege of the Genoese trading port of Kaffa in Crimea by the Golden Horde army of Johnny Begg back in 1347. From Crimea, it was transported by fleas living on the backs of rats that were on the Genoese ships. Evidence suggests that once it came ashore, the Black Death mostly spread from person to person as mnemonic plague. This is why it spread like a wildfire. Black Death has been deemed the second greatest natural disaster to strike Europe during the late Middle Ages and is estimated to have killed 30 to 60 percent of the European population. It also wiped out around one-third of the Middle Eastern population, too. It may have actually reduced the world population by a hundred million in the 14th century. Further outbreaks of the plague kept occurring throughout the late Middle Ages, and because of this and other contributing factors, the European population could not regain its level until the 16th century. In fact, it kept returning to haunt Europe and the Mediterranean throughout the 14th to 17th centuries. According to Jean-Noël Biraben, it was present somewhere in Europe every year between 1346 and 1671. Outbreaks of the plague were seen around the world until the early 19th century. 3. Visits to the doctor. The modern medicine we enjoy nowadays has been preceded by hundreds of years of experimentation and error. And in medieval Europe, a lot of the time, the cure for deadly illnesses was worse than the disease itself. From remedies like mercury pills and lotions that slowly poisoned the afflicted person to death, to treatments like bloodletting that worsened the patient's condition. These treatments were usually administered by healers and doctors who had varying levels of experience. This largely depended on what you could afford. Even during non-plague times, a tiny scratch could cause life-threatening infection and death. In such a situation, presence of a doctor often meant the end was near, and family members would begin mourning preparations. That is, if people even sought one out. Back then, people strongly believed that diseases of the body were the result of sins of the soul, and therefore prayer and meditation were all that was required to cure them. Almost 85% of medieval people were peasants, and most doctors at the time had very little training. In fact, most of them had no formal training besides the ideas and traditions being passed down from one generation to the other. For the poorest class, the local wise women were known to create homemade herbal medicines and potions. Apothecaries were also an option for people who could afford to buy rudimentary drugs. If you needed amputation or dental care back then, a barber surgeon or general surgeon would pull out teeth, let blood or chop off limbs. For the wealthy people, a physician would be summoned by a servant who would then answer questions about their sick master. Most medieval doctors believed that illnesses were caused by an imbalance in the four elements. This teaching was based on Aristotelian and Hippocratic methods. Doctors would therefore pay attention to a patient's bodily fluids. It was also pretty common for them to taste a patient's urine as a means of diagnosis. They would even apply leeches to suck out the diseased blood. Mental illness was stigmatized during the Middle Ages, and it was generally regarded as visitations from Satan or one of his servants. They supposedly entered the body because of witches, warlocks, demons, imps, and other evil creatures. Many medieval physicians were also priests and believed that only a spiritual cure was required for mental disorders. The brutal practice of trepanning was sometimes used. It involved boring a hole in the head to allow evil spirits to exit the body. 4. Great Famine the Great Famine hit Europe between 1315 and 1317. It was the first of a series of large-scale crises that devastated Europe early in the 14th century. The majority of Europe was affected by this disastrous famine. It caused many deaths over an extended number of years. It also marked a clear end to the period of growth and prosperity that began in the 11th century and lasted till the 13th century. The Great Famine began with poor weather in the spring of 1315. Crop failures lasted all through 1316 until the summer harvests of 1317. Europe could not fully recover from the effects of the famine until 1322. Crop failure wasn't the only problem during that time. There was an outbreak of cattle diseases because of which the sheep and cattle numbers fell drastically. The period was marked by extreme levels of crime, 
disease, mass death, and horrific practices, including cannibalism and infanticide. It also brought severe consequences for the church, state, and European society and future calamities. Famines were not unheard of during medieval Europe. In fact, local famines occurred in the Kingdom of France during the 14th century. In the Kingdom of England, besides the Great Famine, there were additional famines in 1321, 1351, and 1369. For the majority of the population, there wasn't enough food and lifespans were, therefore, relatively short and brutal. Surviving to reach old age was quite a struggle. The onset of the Great Famine followed the end of the medieval warm period during which the population of Europe had exploded. Between 1310 and 1330, Europe witnessed some of the worst and most sustained spells of bad weather in the Middle Ages. The winters were severe and the summers were cold and rainy. Experts think that the famine may have been precipitated by a volcanic event and occurred during the Little Ice Age. Unusually heavy rains began in most of Europe during the spring of 1315. It continued to rain throughout spring and summer. The temperature remained cold and led to widespread crop failure. Grains were brought indoors in pots and urns. The straw and hay for animals could not be sighted, so there was no fodder for the livestock. The English lowlands were flooded. The food prices went up to such an extent that the peasants couldn't even afford bread. 5. Preformationism the biological sciences were in their primitive phases during the Dark Ages, and people at that time had some bizarre concepts about human reproduction. In the history of biology, preformationism or preformism is a very popular theory. It proposed that organisms developed from miniature versions of themselves. Instead of assembly from parts, preformationists thought that the form of living things existed in real terms prior to their development. The theory suggested that all organisms were created at the same time and that the succeeding generations grow from homunculi or animalcules, which have existed since the beginning of creation. This theory was typically guided by religious beliefs. The term homunculus meant a diminutive, fully formed human body. It is historically believed to inhabit a germ cell and possessed the capability to increase in size and give rise to an adult human being. Homunculus is Latin for little man or little person. Natural philosophers depicted a homunculus as a tiny person contained within individual sperm. This was used as a way of explaining human development in the womb. Nicholas Hartsoker drew a tiny person inside a sperm back in 1695. The technological limitations provided no mechanical explanations for epigenesis. It was therefore simpler and more convenient to postulate preformed miniature organisms that expanded in accordance with mechanical laws. This explanation was so convincing that some naturalists even claimed to see miniature preformed animals in eggs and miniature plants in seeds. And after the discovery of spermatozoa in 1677, only further solidified. 6. Unconventional Hygiene Practices People in the Middle Ages had some incredibly questionable hygiene practices. One of the grossest of these was their abundant use of urine in daily life. Unfortunately, many physicians during the Dark Ages used to recommend urine as an antiseptic. During the reign of King Henry VIII, the royal physician Thomas Vickery advised all the men in the kingdom that they should wash their battle wounds with urine to prevent any infections. Several other healers and doctors even recommended it as a treatment for the bubonic plague. Numerous manuscripts from that period included images of doctors holding flasks of urine up to the light. Since ammonia in water acts as a caustic but weak base, its high pH tends to break down organic material. This made urine the perfect substance for use in softening and tanning animal hides. Soaking animal skin in urine also made it easier to remove hair and bits of flesh for the leather workers. Ancient Romans infamously used both human and animal urine as mouthwash in order to whiten their teeth. Another problem back then was the scarcity of soaps and detergent, so it was difficult to remove stains, dirt, and grease from clothes. The high ammonia content of human urine also came in handy for this purpose. The urine-based cleaning agents, euphemistically known as chamber lye, were used well into the 19th century. Strangely, women back then were highly discouraged from having body hair, so they used tweezers to pluck it off. 
However, many also used dried cat waste to scrub off hair from the skin. In a book from the 11th century called the De Ornatu Mulierum, there's a passage that says, In order to permanently remove hair, take ants' eggs, red orpiment, and gum of ivy, mix with vinegar and rub the areas. Toilets and privies for the poor people were just septic holes or buckets. Sometimes there were entire wooden or stone rooms with toilet seats for the wealthy. Plumbing was either absent or ineffective, so the waste and garbage that amounted over time was buried away from the towns or villages or were simply thrown in rivers and oceans. This practice of disposing of waste in water gave rise to several new and deadly diseases that spread. Creating farms over the places where waste was buried also contributed to the spread of numerous diseases. 7. Pigment made from mummies Mummy brown or Egyptian brown is a rich brown bituminous pigment. It is defined as the intermediate tint between burnt umber and raw umber and used to be one of the favorite colors of the pre-Raphaelites. The pigment was created during the Middle Ages from the white pitch, myrrh, and the ground-up remains of both human and feline ancient Egyptian mummies mainly. However, the Guanxi mummies of the Canary Islands were also used for this purpose. The pigment had amazing transparency due to which it could be used for glazes, shadows, flesh tones, and shading. The unique color did have a tendency to crack. It was extremely variable in its composition and quality. Because the pigment contained ammonia and particles of fat, it was also more likely to affect other colors with which it was used. One of the most sought-after and famous paintings by Martin Drolling called Interior of a Kitchen made extensive use of mummy brown. Historically, the demand for mummy brown exceeded the available supply of true Egyptian mummies. This led to the occasional substitution of contemporary corpses of slaves and criminals. In 1564, a mummy seller from Alexandria displayed 40 specimens, which he claimed to have manufactured himself. Mummy brown began losing its popularity during the late 19th century when its composition became widely known to artists. The pre-Raphaelite artist Edward Bourne Jones was reported to have ceremoniously buried his tube of mummy brown in his garden when he found out about the true origins of the pigment. By 1915, the demand for mummy brown had plummeted, and by the 20th century, the production of this pigment had largely ceased due to a constant decline in the supply of available mummies. Mummy brown used to be a favorite shade of the pre-Raphaelites, who rejected classical art in favor of realism and natural subjects. While it isn't known precisely which paintings from this period were created using mummy brown, artists Eugene Delacroix, Sir William Beechley, and Edward Byrne Jones are all recorded as having purchased them. In order to make this pigment, mummies used to be transported from Egypt, then ground up in Europe to be sold. In addition to manufacturing paint, the mummy powder was also prescribed by physicians who believed that ingesting it could cure a wide variety of illnesses. 8. Animal Trials The Middle Ages have been stamped an unlucky time to be born, but this wasn't just true for people. Life during that period was equally tough for animals, too. Just like the two-legged owners, all kinds of animals from livestock to insects were put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. In legal history, an animal trial was the criminal trial of a non-human. These trials have been recorded to have taken place in Europe from the 13th century until the 18th. It wasn't always understood that non-human persons lack moral agency and therefore cannot be held culpable for an act. The earliest extant record of an animal trial is often assumed to be found in the execution of a pig in 1266 at fontenay aux rose Such trials remained part of several legal systems until the 18th century, and animal defendants appeared before both church and secular courts. The offenses alleged against them ranged from murder to criminal damage. During these trials, human witnesses were heard, and in the ecclesiastical courts, the animals were provided with lawyers. If convicted, animals would usually be exiled or executed. But there is a case dating back to 1750, when a female donkey was acquitted of charges of deviance due to witnesses to the animal's virtue and good behavior. On the other hand, her co-accused was sentenced to death. A book called The Criminal Prosecution and Capital Punishment of Animals by E.P. Evan, published in 1906, contains detailed records of several medieval animal trials. The animals that were most often punished by Theerstrafen were pigs. 
The criminal procedure was quite similar to that of human trials. The accused animals had to be arrested. They had to appear at a trial hearing held by the secular court. If found guilty of homicide, the animal would be sentenced to the death penalty. According to Johannes Gross, a rooster was put on trial in the city of Basel back in 1474. It was accused of the heinous and unnatural crime of laying an egg. The townspeople were concerned that it was spawned by Satan and contained a cockatrice. Unwanted rats often ended up in courts and found themselves receiving a strongly worded letter ordering them to evict the premises. A dolphin in Marseille was also put on trial in 1596. 9. Knight of Templar Knight of Templar is a medieval institution that enjoyed considerable fame, wealth, and power over its 200-year-long lifetime. But this immense amount of power and wealth eventually led to its disastrous fall. Also known as the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, this Catholic military order was founded in 1119 and was headquartered on the Temple Mountain in Jerusalem. Since it was endorsed by the Roman Catholic Church, the Templar became a favored charity throughout Christendom. They grew in membership and influence. The Templar Knights, in their distinctive white mantles with a red cross, were considered the most skilled fighting units of the Crusades. They were also very prominent in Christian finance. 90% of members of the order were non-combatant. They developed some innovative financial techniques that were an early form of banking. They were able to build a network of almost 1,000 commanderies and fortifications throughout Europe and the Holy Land. Modern scholars opine that they formed the world's first multinational corporation because the Templars were closely tied to the Crusades. When they were unable to secure their holdings in the Holy Land, support for the order slowly decreased. They had accumulated immense quantities of gold over the years and were accountable to the Pope only. Their wealth was tempting to the enemies, the most important being King Philip IV of France, who finally put an end to the order. The secrets surrounding their religious activities and their secret initiation ceremony created distrust and eventually served as an excuse for the execution of many top Templars. In order to arrest the Templars, King Philip violated the Omni Datum Optimum Decree, so even the Pope could not prevent him from going after the Knights. He accused the Templars of engaging in blasphemous acts and rituals. They were accused of heinous acts like homosexuality, refusal to observe sacred rituals, and even worshipping false idols. Most of the Templars were forced to make false confessions under torture. Despite the Pope's attempts to save them, the King declared 54 Templars guilty and ordered that they be burned at the stake. The Knights of Templar was officially disbanded by the Pope in 1312. Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master of the Knight of Templar, was acquitted and kept imprisoned by the King, who wanted him to reveal the hidden treasure of the Templars. De Molay refused to do so, therefore. He was later sentenced to death and slowly burned at stakes in Ile aux Juifs in Paris. 10. The Iron Maiden Torturing Device Another harrowing torture device from the Dark Ages which was used to unfairly torture the European people was the Iron Maiden. It was increasingly painful for the victims, but for the one using it, the Iron Maiden was morbidly entertaining. It is also known as Virgin or Jangfer. It may seem like a rocking metal band, but in reality, it is a device of nightmares. The Iron Maiden was a metal human-sized box or an iron coffin that was lined with spikes on the inside. It consisted of double doors in the front, which aided in the quick placement of the victim inside it. The victims were thrown in the device for interminable amounts of time, and they couldn't do much. They were mercilessly pierced by metal protrusions. In many cases, the legs of the victims started to tire out. Despite having a reputation for being the most torturous medieval tool, there's little evidence regarding its existence before the 18th century. But some reports have proven that a slightly digging version of the Iron Maiden was used in Europe around 200 BC. Some historians also claim that the device was used for the first time in August 1515 to execute a coin forger. This device has the most straightforward operating mechanism among all the medieval torture tools. The two doors could be easily opened and closed. The victims were forced inside, and the doors were shut tight. 
The spikes placed inside the device would pierce through multiple organs of the victim's body, causing severe injuries or even death due to the excessive blood loss over many hours. The positioning of the spikes was crucial to torture. The length, placement, and sharpness of the spikes were decided depending on the degree of torture required. In most cases, two spikes were placed to penetrate the eyes, and others were placed to pierce the chest, genitals, and other internal body organs. In order to prolong the torture, it was ensured that the spikes didn't pierce very deep inside the organs or cause sudden death. If the Iron Maiden was supposed to be used on a famous person, a royal family member, or a bigger enemy, it used to be custom-made according to the body measurements of the victim, 